This is the New Yorker Radio Hour, a co-production of WNYC Studios and The New Yorker. Welcome to the New Yorker Radio Hour. I'm David Remnick. A Paul Thomas Anderson film is an event. He wrote and directed Boogie Nights, Magnolia, The Master, There Will Be Blood, and Phantom Thread. And his new film is already on critics' best of the year list. It's called Licorice Pizza. It's a return to where Paul Thomas Anderson grew up and still lives, the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. Do you know who I am? Yeah. Do you know uh, who my girlfriend is? Barbara Streisand? <laughs> Barbara Streisand. Sand. Sand, yeah, like sands, like the ocean, like beaches. Barbara Streisand? <sighs> no, but Streisand. Sand. Licorice Pizza is a joyful, disconnected romp about growing up and friendship. It follows the misadventures of two young people in the 1970s trying, somehow, to make it big and create themselves. They're played by Cooper Hoffman and Alana Heim, both in their first film roles and each in their own way, stunning. I reach Paul Thomas Anderson at his home in the Valley. I have to ask you about where you are now, where I think we're, we're talking to you, which is in San Fernando Valley. Faulkner had his patch of Mississippi and Toni Morrison and her patch of Ohio and Philip Roth and Newark and so on. And you've got this part of the world and you're drawn to it in, in a number of movies, Boogie Nights, Magnolia, now Licorice Pizza. Why do you go home again all the time in your films? What draws you to the Valley? God, it's... Um, I love it. I love it. Uh, it's as simple as that. It sort of begins and ends there. Um, I mean, the valley is not the prettiest place in the world. It is not the most cultured place in the world. I understand that. But, you know, I can remember being a kid and thinking at a certain point, probably in my teenage years, you know, I've got to get out of here. There's And out of here either being either over the hill or maybe that's New York, maybe that's London, maybe it's Shanghai, whatever it is, I have to get out of here. And I'm one of those people that, you know, loves to get away for 24 hours and then I start getting itchy and thinking about back home. I just want to come back home. Well, I, I get the East Coast version, which is like I grew up in what I thought was the dullest place in the world, which was a kind of middle-class suburban New Jersey, and always looking to New York City. Yeah. And I would listen to late-night radio or television. Everybody from California would make jokes about the valley. They were obviously in, you know, it, I didn't know what that was. W what was the joke? What, what, what is the valley in, in, a, in a spiritual sense and in terms of the landscape of your youth and what you are, and you've never left, really? I mean, the San Fernando Valley, what is it? It's a suburb. And I guess a suburb seemed to always come in for a beating. Um, I'm not quite sure why. You know, and I guess my gravity was that when I was first writing Boogie Nights, when I was, I was a teenager, there was a terrific story in my own backyard. I mean, it, I didn't have to go far. I didn't have to, I didn't have to make things up. It, it, was, it was just familiar to me. I, was ta I, was, I guess at some point I probably read, you know, write what you know. I was like, well... That's a good place to start. So why am I struggling to try to learn something that, that's beyond my grasp or that doesn't speak to me? Well, Licorice Pizza is centered on two characters. One, a, a, a teenage guy who's incredibly charismatic for his age. He's a small-time actor. He starts a waterbed business and then a pinball palace. And his kind of bravado is amazing for somebody 15 years old. And he falls for a girl much older than him, certainly at that age, it feel, feels incredibly older. It was in her mid-20s. And who herself has a, a, a thwarted life, but an inner intelligence that's also magnetic. How is that rooted in your experience? If you're writing what you know, what's the, what's the germ of the story of Licorice Pizza for you? Um, I was the second of four, so I had an older sister and a buddy of mine had an older sister, and we just sort of happened to fall in the cracks that when we were 14, 15, you know, these were girls that were around us, our sister's friends who were 18, 19, they had cars. So every waking hour was devoted to try to get them to drive us somewhere, you know, to hang out. <laughs> that's like, the key. You know, that's the key. <clears throat> and certainly probably behind it was trying to flirt with them or get noticed by them in some way that was more than just an irritating little brother. 
I can remember having a couple friendships with some of those girls that I met along the way that were, and they were, they were just friendships, but they were, they were fantastic, you know, to have um, a friendship with just slightly older woman that wasn't your sister and had a toe into the version of the adult world or what started to feel adult because they just because of the transportation that they had. I mean, they're still only 19, <laughs> 20 years old, but you know, like you said, this sort of the, the, the measuring stick is so insane when you're, when you're young, you know, somebody who's, who's 20 is, is like a full, full grown adult to a 15 year old. There, there are, I think, uh, many ways to make a film. You know, you, you read about filmmakers who everything is, Hitchcock is this way or was said to be this way, that everything was mapped out, storyboarded, every shot was prepared. The, the meticulousness of the, the film was structured and almost pre-edited. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, Jean-Luc Godard, who's making it, he's writing the script for the day that morning. And there's a kind of haphazard, seemingly haphazard way of going about it. Your films always have a voice. I'm always rushing to see them because I know I'm hearing from you in the most personal way. How much of that comes out of the writing? Is, the, is that the most crucial element of the creative process for you? And maybe take us through how that happened with Licorice Pizza. The, the writing, it all begins and ends with the writing. Um, I mean, that's an over-exaggeration, but the point of that is to say that if the writing is good, you've got a, you've got a very good shot at making a good film, or you've got a good shot of making your day. You've got some clarity that you're walking into the situation with. Um, and the reason you know is because when you write a scene that doesn't work, you generally spend way too much time trying to do it. You spend too much time reshooting it, rewriting it, trying it a hundred different ways, and then you realize like this scene doesn't belong in the film. It's like, after this many years, you'd think you'd be able to spot it quicker. Like, uh, and actually, on this time, a couple times we did. I had some scenes that I wrote that just were not working. And I would say to Alana and Cooper, I said, well, what if you didn't say any of this dumb dialogue that I wrote and you just walked or silently looked at each other? And it was great. And we'd have this magical thing. Mm. And it was a classic example of like, too much with the dialogue, enough with the writing, you know? Get out of it. Stay out of it. You mentioned Cooper, who is Cooper Hoffman, who's the son of the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Alana is Alana Heim, who's has been known until now um, as, in a terrific band with her sisters. Now, there's a certain audacity in picking those two as lead actors in a major film. Um, why'd you choose them? <sighs> you know, I knew Alana had uh, certainly the talent and the confidence. Um, just from her years as a performer. Um, and I knew Cooper had the heart and the soulfulness, but that was unclear whether he could really, you, you, knew, you, you could never know. You never know if someone's going to have that kind of um, talent in front of your eyes. And then you turn on a movie camera and they become like, you know, Pee Wee Herman and Pee Wee's Big Adventure when he's like <laughs> staring into the camera or mouthing the other person's line. I mean, it's always possible, believe me. But the more that we read the script together and hung out together and really investigated this as a real possibility, it was like, I'm looking for two authentic, genuine people who can't hide their emotions. Uh, and here they are right in front of me. Where are your parents? My mom works for me. Oh, of course she does. Yes, she does that in my public sense. relations company. In your public relations company? Because you have that. Yes. And you're an actor. Yes. And you're a secret agent too. <laughs> well, no, I'm not a secret agent. <laughs> That's funny. Are you joking? Well, no, I'm not. That's a lot. It gets complicated. I'm sure and all that math homework you have to do after everything. So they were the choices from the start. There were no auditions. There were no mental sorting. There was no auditions for Alana's part. That was what I was doing, and that was how I, what I had set my mind on. When it came to casting... And you, you had made a music video with her, I think. Yeah, many, many. I mean, I've worked with her yeah, sisters yeah. for a number of years now. I have a collaboration that extends beyond the music videos. I love them as a family. I love their music. And, and so we're, we're very intertwined that way. And I mentioned Cooper's name to Alana, Danielle, Esty, the three sisters, and they were 
they talk all the time, these Heim sisters, all the time. They're always talking all over each other. And when you say something <laughs> that, it, that lands, they all stop talking and they kind of looked at me and I said, well, I think maybe that's a good idea. I've gotten them, I've got their attention. They had been introduced to him, I guess about oh, five or six years ago now. He came to town and I was looking after him and I had to go off and take care of something. So I said, babysit, babysit him, hang out with him for a minute. And they, they did. And, and they were taken by him as everybody is that meets him incredibly personable, charming, empathetic, unique person. Obviously, you've worked, you worked with the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, Cooper's father. I, I, I guess I hesitate to ask this question because it might be somehow off or vulgar, but did they resemble each other in any way, both as people and as, as artists, as actors? No, I mean, there's a physical resemblance, sure, but in, in, but what I think is nice is that Cooper is it, it really his own own person. He's got his mom's eyes and his mom's smile. Um, from time to time, he he turns his head and he looks a lot like his dad. But, you know, it would be, it, it, it's sort of, you know, working with Phil's like working with Daniel or Joaquin. They were, they had been doing it for so long. They had, they had figured out the business of acting in movies. You know, the last four movies prior to this, you worked with Daniel Day-Lewis twice and Joaquin Phoenix twice, two astonishing, experienced actors. They know what they're doing, to say the least. Your stars here are both superb, but they're relative rookies. How does that change the way you work with them? What's the process there? Well, it's different, for sure. It's different somebody that's been doing it a long time knows how to pace themselves physically, emotionally, you know, over the course of 65 days. Um, mm. It would have been very natural, and I could see that the amount of nerves and concentration and energy that, that they were putting into this, that they could have burned out quite easily, you know. Um, I had to take them through each step of the process and give them enough time to prepare and, you, you know, you get to the basic things like, Especially with Cooper, he's a, he's sixteen, seventeen years old. Like, have you eaten breakfast? Have you had a <laughs> Have you had a snack? You know, are you tired? <laughs> you really do have to take care of them in that way. Where you're working with an adult who's done it for forty years, but it, it was much more in the pragmatic pieces of what it means to go to work each day over a period of time, and the emotional parts, and the words and the characters that they were playing. It was clear to them, and it was. One of the most beautiful things to watch, sort of the difference between day one and day three, the difference between day three and day five, you know. I have to tell you, I can't imagine an Oscars ceremony this coming year without seeing Alana Haim as, as, as a central figure in it. it. Her performance is a knockout. And again, she's doing it the first time out of the box. Yes, she's a performer, a musician. She's been on stage a million times. But how do you... How did that does does this how does this happen? Um, I think the answer is is that some people have a gift. <laughs> uh, Daniel Day Lewis has a gift. Joaquin Phoenix has a gift. Um, Phil had a gift, and some people can um, make words explode out of their mouth on a movie screen that appear that they have just been formulated in their mind and their heart, and. They can do it all the while while they're walking, talking, and it's like weird. And I was very concerned um, because there's a long history of probably film directors who thought they were seeing some brilliant performance in front of their eyes when in fact they were like blinded by some light or something. And I would constantly check in with guys that I was working with around the camera. Um, like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because this seems like, I knew she'd be good, but she's just like, She's so unpredictable and she's so scary, but you can wrap your arms around her. You know, she's like all of these things at once. I don't know what it is. Like, she's got it. Some of my favorite bits in the movie are when Hollywood intrudes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Streisand's boyfriend at the time is John Peters, and he <laughs> <laughs> he's an ins insanely weird character. And then there's this Sean Penn moment who is a kind of Hollywood blowhard, and he, he has a fantastic, I don't know, five, ten minutes in the film. Um, but it leads me to ask you, how is Hollywood treating a creature like you these days? You, you know, in other words, you're not making 
Marvel films. You're not making the Fast and Furious franchise films. Um, on the other hand, you're not making tiny indie films either. You're making films for adults on a mid-sized budget. How are you looking at the landscape of the business these days? Boy, I it 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 warms my heart to be able to tell you that I I feel happier than ever working in this business. Um, I've got my own little corner of the sandbox. I'm working with people that I really admire and like at MGM. But that's me, you know. And I'm this this is what I've been doing for a minute. And I know there's. It's, there's no end to the kind of sky is falling questions that always surround films and 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 what's going to happen and obviously it's gotten even more complicated and it's more tangible with dialogue about streaming and the sort of overabundance of superhero movies and stuff and you know it seems to be something that's popular these days to sort of wonder have they ruined movies and all this kind of stuff I just don't feel that way I mean look we're all nervous about people getting back to the theater, but you know what's going to get them back in the movie theater? Spider-Man. So let's be happy about that. So that's an okay thing? Absolutely, it's an okay thing. The director, Paul Thomas Anderson. Licorice Pizza is in theaters now. You'll be glad to know, or I, I don't know if you'll be, I hope you'll be glad to know that Richard Brody's top movies of the year just came out and, and you and, and the French Dispatch were the top two. So that's, <laughs> it's good company. You know, I just read Richard's a review of our film, and I was still sort of processing it all. I've had good reviews in my day, but this one might take the cake. No, that's great to hear. Had an old, cold, black heart like mine kind of, <laughs> kind of warmed up a little bit. It's pretty great. <laughs>